I'm going to sit here nice and quiet. <laughs> okay. I think I know what's going on. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. I was waiting for those credits to go off the screen to let me know that the music's actually off. We've got another problem in the studio. Go figure. Welcome to live television. Um, and for those of you out there, I'll go ahead and diagnose it from up here. The light on the actual speaker is flickering. There's yeah. some kind of short in there. So you might want to play with it, jiggle it. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to hear callers when they call in. But we'll go ahead and trudge on through uh, regardless. Welcome to the Atheist Experience, as I pointed I mentioned a minute ago. This is a live public access television program where anything can happen at any time. I'm Matt Dillahunty, and joining me this week is Don Baker. Good to be here. How you doing? Great, great. And you were all bubbly beforehand, and now you're kind of quiet. Oh, yeah. Well, it's like when stuff starts breaking, I can't fix it. I, don't know I see the do. light. Wait, okay, I can test this real quick. Watch. <laughs> Speaker okay. works. We solved the problem already. We're, we're like okay. a minute and 30 seconds in. we got a lot of in. smart people helping us out. That's great. Yeah, there's a lot of people yeah. behind the scenes who scrambled the second something broke right before the show. So thanks to them. This is April 20th, 2008. We're live. We're sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. The ACA has weekly meetings every Sunday beginning at around 11 o'clock at Romeo's on Barton Springs Road. And you're any, it's, they're open to the public, except for the first Sunday of the month when we have a lecture series, which is also open to the public, sorry, um, at the Austin History Center, located at the corner of 9th and Guadalupe. The May lecture will not happen. Instead, we'll be having the ACA uh, directorship uh, elections uh, direct to elect the new board of directors. Uh, so if you're a member and uh, you're interested in participating in that, and we encourage you to, please visit the website, www.atheist-community.org. Or you can in, email uh, info at or president at or TV at atheist-community.org. Any of those will get you in touch with somebody who can help you get information about the actual elections uh, on May 1st. So um, it's, it's also there's information there about who's eligible to vote and who's eligible to run. Um, but we'll, we'll sideline all of that because most of the people around the world aren't that interested in it. And we are actually broadcasting around the world. The, the audio portion of this is available for download as a podcast. The video is available for download and viewing at Google Video. And in addition to this program, the ACA also sponsors a biweekly internet audio podcast called The Nonprofits. That's uh, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. Uh, you can find more information at nonprofitsradio.com, the website that's on your screen right now. It's hosted by Dennis Lubay, features Russell Glasser, myself, Ann Schilling. And we'll be live again this coming Saturday. I'm not quite sure what all we're talking about, but I imagine Expelled will probably be on the agenda. Uh, some of us went and saw Expelled Friday night, and I'm sure there'll be more comment about it then. For anybody who wants to contact the ACA, there's a Frequently Asked Questions page at our website. If you don't get through on the telephone today or you don't want to or you don't, you're, you're dissatisfied with the answer, um, you can go there and to the website and, and view the Frequently Asked Questions. You can also email tv at atheist-community.org. And um, we had to, to make a slight change this week. Um, the spam filter has been turned on because we seriously just... I mean, got completely flooded. I think my uh, five, five or six hundred in a matter of a few well, hours. Pretty much everybody on the internet is getting this. this and stuff it's now. yeah, it's a lot of return stuff. So we we've engaged the spam filter. If you want your email to get through, I'd recommend that you in the subject line include something like AETV or NPR or something else uh, in addition to the to the actual subject, um, so that it, we can maybe get it through the spam filters and it doesn't look like trash. Uh, there's a contact form on the website that, that you can use. That will help that we, that we see it. Uh, we uh, get so many emails that we have trouble responding to all of them. Right. So, so just because <laughs> we try, yeah. we try to answer them. But I, uh, we, we do a good job of, of getting responses back to most of the email that comes in, even if it's, I mean, I apologize. I, I've gotten to the point where some of them I'll just respond with, you know, a thank you and, and send it back um, just, just so that people know that their emails have been, you know, read. Uh, but we even, even doing that, I still can't get to all of them. So... Uh, we appreciate your patience and understanding with that. Um, anything that's, that's been kind of significant, um, we do respond to, and we you know try to address on the shows from time to time. There was a discussion uh, on last week's shows. One of the callers called in to talk a little bit about Infinity, and I was I mentioned that you know in, at least in my opinion he was using a, a variation of Zeno's paradox. So that prompted a big discussion about whether or not he actually was. Um, so if you want to call back in and talk about that later on too, you may. Um, we can always rediscuss old topics. In addition to this program and the nonprofits, the ACA also hosts a number of social events throughout the month, and including a weekly happy hour at the Dog and Duck Pub located at the corner of 17th and Guadalupe. That's every Thursday beginning at around 7 o'clock. 
um, and lasting until we give up and, and head out. And so if you want to come down and have drinks or something good to eat uh, and, and have a, an evening of conversation, that's always available. Um, and after this program's over, we get together to go to El Arroyo on 5th Street. The address is right there on your screen. Um, we're on until 4.30. We begin going down there around 5 o'clock or so. It lasts maybe till 7 or, or so. Um, any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come to any of our events. You do not have to be a member. But if you're coming down to preach, proselytize, or provoke, please don't. Uh, we'll have the number up for you very shortly, and you can call in and, and ask questions and have discussions about whatever you want. In addition to the ACA elections that are occurring uh, May 3rd, uh, which would be the, what somebody say, 4th? We went back and forth on this as to whether it's the 4th or the 3rd. May 1st is Thursday. May 1st is the National Day of Reason, and we'll be down at the state capitol uh, on that Thursday. Um, there'll be more details on the website soon. We're putting everything together. Um, it's, it coincides with the National Day of Prayer, but our event is, is becoming uh, kind of separate from that now. We're down there to... Um, to rally for, to church, rally for church state separation, mm -hmm. reason, evidence, um, you know, to encourage good decision-making processes, and really to, to kind of just come out uh, for reason in general. I mean, why, why, mm -hmm. why should we have any, any other reason? What reason could possibly be better than encouraging people to, to think and, and make decisions based on, on good evidence and reason? Right. And we would invite religious groups that, would, that support church-state separation to come down and join us. Yeah. Uh, it, won't, it won't be an embarrassment for you. And we, we, uh, we think that church-state separation is a good thing for, for everyone. And there were some religious people who joined us last year down there in favor of church-state separation. So we're looking forward to that. The June 1st lecture is going to be Representative Donna Howard. Um, that's, that's the normal ACA lecture at the Austin History Center. And she's going to be talking about some of the time that was wasted in the last legislative session uh, here in Texas on uh, religious bills and, and things that ended up just being big time wasters. It's stuff that the legislature shouldn't have to worry about at all. Nobody should be wasting taxpayers' time and, and money on these issues when there are real issues to tackle. So I think that covers all of the announcements. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, uh, I, the, the official topic is, uh, is how can be, you be moral with God? Oh. But, uh, you know, we get a lot of people asking, how can you be moral without God, you know, and, and God is the basis of our morality. And so, uh, and atheists are assumed to lack a moral foundation. So, and, and atheists are mistrusted because of this. And, and so, it, so this sort of thing needs to be addressed. So the, the reasoning of theists, I think, is that moral laws require, require a lawgiver. <coughs> and the lawgiver is the flying spaghetti monster. No, is God. Uh, by definition. And God is also the source of abs absolute morality and is also the divine judge. Um, and good will be rewarded and bad will be punished in the afterlife sometime in the grand and glorious future and justice will prevail. And those without God are morally adrift or worse. They're, or they worship the devil or something. So that's, that's kind of the reasoning that, that or pseudo-reasoning that goes on. There's, I, I want to address the, these claims and then flip the question around and ask how can you be moral with God? So that's what I'd like to do today. And as usual, I have far more material, so I'm going to try to hit the good stuff, the, the really good stuff or the new stuff first. Um, but, but the other topics are also important. Um, so anyway, so we'll see how far we get. Uh, maybe we'll get some callers. So the problems with this reasoning that I just proposed is, is there is no basis given for our moral sense coming from outside of humanity. So, so why would you assume that our, our moral sense has to be come from somewhere else? So that's, that's one question that never seems to be answered. Uh, there's no evidence given for, for the existence of God or gods. Nobody can agree on what God is, what his name is, how many there are, what sex is it, what... What, or what a divine morality looks like, right? So we have various holy books, but they're conflicting. They say different things. They're from different traditions. They make conflicting statements within them. They are subject to interpretation, so somebody can read one thing one way and read another thing another way. I've called the Bible a Rorschach test for the morally challenged, meaning you can find anything you want in there and justify pretty much anything you want, um, and uh, it's all true. Okay, and, and we're going to hit that a little bit. So uh, there's no evidence for this divine justice. And um, 
There's no evidence for good and evil as things, as tangible things or, or, or beings with little, little horns and, and angel, angel halos or whatever uh, pulling us in various directions, sitting on our shoulders, that sort of thing. There's no evidence that atheists are less moral than anyone else. All right, there's, you know, there's secular countries in Europe, pretty largely secular, and they, they get it pretty, done pretty well. We can talk about that in more detail. So in reality, our morality is based on the fact that we share the same environment, we share the same ability to reason, we share the same need to survive, reproduce, grow. Uh, we have largely the same DNA, the same sort of physical makeup. We have many of the same instincts, drives, capabilities. Uh, we're social animals. And so morality is a result of the fact that we are social animals. We have to cooperate to survive and do well. There's a lot of benefit to our species to survive, to work together to survive, right? If you are ostracized from a society, you are back down to getting your own food, uh, building your own shelter and these sorts of things. Here we can trade our work for, you know, in, in my case, uh, you know, computer work, which I enjoy doing, for things that I can't do very well or I don't enjoy doing of, you know, having a house and, and driving around in a car and these sorts of things. So, um, so we're much better off as a, as a society. And so morality is the sort of price we pay to be part of that society. We, we want to, we want to <clears throat> morality is inherently humid, uh, though it can be extended to other treat, how we treat other species. So one way to, to, to think about morality as being inherently human is just ask yourself, if there weren't any humans, would there be any need for morality? Right? That's, that's one question you can answer yourself. If there's just one human, I don't think there's any need for morality. I think morality has to do with how we treat each other, how, how one human treats another, how one tr human treats another, another, an animal of another species, that sort of thing. So uh, atheist morality, or the morality that atheists subscribe to, which is really the morality that everybody subscribes to, even though they attribute it to God, uh, is that we all have the ability to feel compassion for others, right? We have that innate ability that is part of our wiring, that's part of our ability to, uh, to, to reason about others' predicaments and things. We have the ability to reason in general. We have the ability to, to reason about the consequences of our actions. And we effectively treat others how we would like to be treated. I mean, this is the sort of foundation of morality. And this, this has been around long before Jesus, uh, Confucius, had a statement of to this effect 500 years before, but it's been around a long time. So, and, and as a result, others can treat us back how we treat them. So there's this notion of building up a uh, reputation, right? Because if I treat you badly, you're gonna remember that and stay away from me, right? Or if I you know, go off and murder somebody, people are gonna come after me because they don't wanna be murdered. So there's the notion of reputation and responsibility. So for me, morality has to do with reason, responsibility, and compassion. Those are, those are what I think are the kind of main things, and, and these things uh, are, are the, the moral foundation. There's no God there. God is absent from that. And in fact, our laws are based on a sec secular morality. We, we, we as humans work together and create a society, and abiding by those laws is, is the price we pay to participate and to get the benefits of that society. So today I want to turn the question around. How can you be moral with God, right? Or apparently God is, a, is an afterthought, is, an, is, a, is a bag on the side that's not necessary. I have no need of that hypothesis, apparently. So uh, we, can, we can ditch it. We don't need it. So the problems I see with supernatural moralities is what I want to hopefully hit today, but, but uh, I'm, I may not get to all the topics because I've got a lot of material here. What I want to talk about is that God-based God moralities are effectively con games. Okay, <laughs> so, so, you know, once you put God in there, you, you are, are in the realm of con games, is, is, is as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to demonstrate that today. The second point is that God creates a conflict of interest with human needs. So God's more powerful, therefore God's more important, therefore humans are less important, and, and therefore you're, you're sacrificing sort of the human participation in human things to, to, to please your God. A third thing is religions are based on a broken model of the world, which uh, are many of these things I've hit before. And these three things are not mutually exclusive. In fact, uh, there, you can see uh, in, in many of the examples I come up, you can see shades of both of these things. 
So um, to, to get to the instinct thing, uh, just to mention very briefly, we, you know, we have uh, studies being done on morality and where it comes from and how, what parts of the brain are involved with moral decision making. We have studies that, that look at chimpanzees and other higher primates to see that they have a notion of, uh, of altruism and a notion of fairness and, and uh, a notion of compassion for each other and, and this can be demonstrated and there's a number of books on that. Let me give you a little quick pointers. Mark Hauser wrote a book called The Moral Minds that uh, says that the brain is genetically shaped mechanism for acquiring moral rules and there's a notion of a universal moral grammar much like our innate ability to, uh, to, to handle and process language. Um, there's another book called uh, Primates and Philosophers called from uh, primatologist uh, Franz de Waal. Um, so those are some, some things. But I just want to mention that, that you know, we have a lot of evidence that, that morality is both biological and both innate. Both, both, both things are true, that they come from our, they come from our, our background. So, so let's talk about uh, God as, as con games. Um, so for, let me just give you an example of what I mean here. There's this notion of a sins, what I call the sin scam. Okay? So in secular morality, if, if someone, if I harm Matt, if I do something bad to Matt. I'm um, going to take you out. You're going to take me out. Okay. Well, there's this notion that the perpetrator redresses the harm, that I have to pay a penalty somehow, right? right. Either I uh, reimburse you for the harm I've done, or I go to jail for the harm I've done, or these sorts of things. And I sort of have to pay for the harm I've caused you, right? So it's largely a trade of, of some weird sense between the perpetrator and the victim, right. okay? With religion, if I harm Matt, I've committed a sin against God, okay? And therefore, it is, uh, the perpetrator has to pay the church, okay? I have to pay the church because that's, that's, uh, that's who I've, who I've wronged. Uh, the victim is expected to forgive me. And so the net result is that the church makes money off of your, the, my crime to you. So, so this is this is what I call the sin scam. So this and this is just the scratching the surface of the con games. So before we talk about where this con game stuff comes from, let me present to you a kind of tongue-in-cheek mathematical proof that God created the universe and Christianity is true. Thank you guys. So yeah, I really have a mathematical proof here that 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 uh, that God created the universe and Christianity is true. So so let me go through it real quick. God is transcendent, like infinity. So God is very much like infinity. How can we understand God? Well, if God is infinity, it's very much like uh, God is infinite and unknowable. It's like having something without the ability to comprehend it, or one divided by zero. Okay, so that's, that's another way of des describing infinity. So in the beginning, before, before the universe was created, there was nothing, and nothing is nothing, and Nothing, from nothing comes nothing comes nothing. So it just c keeps going on and on. So, but when we have God acting on the nothingness, all right, we can multiply both sides by God, right? And uh, so that's like God acting on the nothingness. Uh, we can expand this, this expression, God is one over zero, okay? I'm just doing mathematical operations here. We're rearranging the numerators on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, we know that uh, anything times zero is zero. On the right-hand side, anything divided by anything is one. Um, so we effectively end up with zero equals one, or symbolically, God created the universe. Okay? So God created the universe. So, so my first statement has been proven true. If God created the universe and the sun is just as powerful as the God, and you say, well, you know, you just got to believe or you got to believe or uh, I am what I am or some other true statement and throw it in. And we add these all together, we get one equals three. And so we have the, the notion that the Trinity is true, right? That, that God is exactly the same as God, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We got Casper there as the Holy Ghost. Isn't that great? Okay. So God created the universe and Christianity is true. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. That's enough for the slides. <laughs> Okay, hopefully, hopefully you found that amusing. Um, <laughs> I find it amusing. So, um, so I proved that, that, that God created the universe. Now, the fallacy in that proof I just gave is that God 
like infinity, uh, which, is a, which, which are both concepts in people's minds, can do any work in the real world. That's, that's the logical fallacy in both my little proof and in the religions, right? That God cannot do any work in the real world because it's imaginary, okay? So, claims about God are usually backed up with this logical fallacy of special pleading. You have to specially plead God in, into existence. So God is so powerful that we can't detect him. Or God is everywhere, but he exists nowhere. We can't find him. Or he's so intelligent that we can't comprehend anything at all about God. Or he's so fat that we can't get our minds around him. Or he plays peekaboo so well that we can't find him. You know, he, these sorts of so things. so imaginary, he must be real. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So these are all examples of special pleading that you, that you assume that this thing Thing that you're trying to prove exists has a certain property that prevents you from knowing it exists. See, that's that's actually <laughs> one of my favorite proofs, though, is because um, the the ontological argument that, that ends up mm -hmm. saying that God exists because it's it's more perfect to exist than not to exist, right. and so we've <laughs> right. defined God as being the most perfect being. However, which being is is more powerful, the being who can create worlds and save your sins? or the being that can do that while simultaneously not existing. <laughs> I'd say the one that doesn't exist is more powerful, and therefore God doesn't exist. I like that. So I think that's, that's the point here is, is, first off, these are all just word games to try to make you believe something. And, and, and religions admit this because they say, oh, well, you've got to have faith. Yeah. Right. There's no. There's no reason here. You gotta have faith. There's Welcome the to the grand right. mystery. All the mysteries of mystery of the mystery of the birth and the death. It's all. It's, yeah. They're answering mysteries with mysteries. Right. Right. And and so this gets to the point. You've sort of already made it, and that is that that once you accept these logical fallacies as true, you can come up with anything you want. Sure. So you used it and went off, went left on it, right? And that's perfectly valid. It's just as valid as what the theists are doing. Right? Oh, no. Mine's say, true. <laughs> okay. So yeah. in there's mathematics, no, there's we no call fallacy this the property there. of soundness, right? That once, once you have a logical system with a falsehood in it, whatever you derive from that is effectively uh, cannot, be, cannot be guaranteed as true anymore. The, the system is considered unsound. So by analogy, if you apply this to a morality system, a system of morality based on this belief, you end up being able to prove anything you want. Anything you want at all is justified in a morality where you is based on logical fallacies. So God is, is absolutely a logical fallacy and these sorts of things. So, um, so if anything is true, then anything is religiously justifiable. Um, but the ends tend to tend to benefit the the purveyor, right? Have you ever noticed that? How how you know God God is invoked to do whatever, but it always benefits the speaker. <laughs> well, the, other, the other part of the con game thing with regard to religion is that um, these religions have invented things and labeled them as sins, even though there's often no harm to anybody else. This idea of thought crime to, to make mm -hmm. you feel guilty for you know doubting or lusting or any of these other things, even if you didn't act upon it, um, you've still committed this sin, and therefore you know you owe penance or you need to pay for an indulgence or you need to apologize to God and 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 whatever. Right. Uh, so right. yeah, it's, keep you keep you jumping. There's a two stage con there. Right. So uh, religious morality is a, is a, is the opposite of absolute morality. It's it's really arbitrary. It's completely arbitrary. So so it is actually true with God, all things are possible, right? Because when you assume a falsehood, all things are possible from that. Or all things are true, right? So all things can be rationalized with God. So if you want to kill, you make a claim that God is on your side, or you want to. Uh, we'll take the caller in a minute. If you want to, uh, you know, uh, claim that you hear voices from God, you can go off and kill. Both Bush and Hitler have used that tactic. Uh, if you want to have sex with 16-year-olds, you become involved with a Mormon cult or the Catholic Church, one or the other. Seems way too old for those way guys. Way too old for those guys. Okay. Um, if you want to make some serious money, preach the prosperity of the gospel. If you want to use the Bible, you can use it to justify genocide, torture, abuse of children, uh, lies and propaganda, thievery, oppression, abortion even. You can use it. You know, how about eating children? We, let, let's use the Bible to, to, to advocate eating children. 
Well, Christ is supposed to be, have been childlike, right? You know, that's one of the phrases in the Bible, right? Catholics allegedly eat, eat the body and, and blood of Christ, so why not eat children? Isn't that more godlike than, than eating crackers? So, so, yeah, you can justify anything you want with, with God. So I'm sure a lot of callers are saying, Whoa, that's not my religion. I don't believe that. Um, well, um, that's, that might be true. So, uh, you know, you might be believing, you know, since, since, since belief in God doesn't imply anything at all, he implies everything, uh, you might be just relying on your secular morality to, to arrive at your conclusions and, and attributing it to God. So God is effectively stealing or, or you're playing maybe having the fallacy of confirmation bias where you say, well, I'm going to ignore all the bad stuff because I don't understand it or whatever and, and just, just claim the good stuff. And so really the, what's going on here with religious morality is this, it's mind games, right? It's mind games of believing falsehoods at, at the onset and then you know, the, the consequences of that uh, you know, God is very convenient because people won't challenge God generally. They won't, they won't stand up and say, that makes no sense. Uh, atheists try to do that, uh, and we're vilified for doing that. And then and you also have other logical fallacies like confirmation bias and so on. So this is my first topic. We have a caller, so this is a good time to maybe switch, sure. to, switch to the caller. We got, is it Alan? Yeah. How you doing, hey, Alan? Alan? I'm doing great. I love your show. I'm calling from Houston, Texas. Oh, okay. wow. So you didn't um, mind being on hold nearly so much. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, why do y'all think people that aren't religious don't believe in a God? Once they have a child, they start believing in them. I don't know that to be true. Do you have, do you have evidence that that happens? Because we have, well, yeah, we have yeah, a lot I, of parents I, I, in our I group. have, like, a friend. You know, our friends in general that, like, wouldn't go, they don't go to church or anything, right. but then they have a kid, and then... Yeah. That's what they tell me. They're like, well, as soon as you have a kid, then maybe you'll understand. I've, I've had a friend or two of mine tell me that, too, that, um, that you know, well, they, they always believed. But the thing that was the clincher for them was the moment that their child was born and they looked into their child's eyes and uh, they're just, you know, overwhelmed with their love for their new child. And, and it's a miracle, quote, unquote. So yeah. this ends up being kind of... of the linchpin that that seals up their their belief uh, I, I i can't say that they're wrong because i don't have any kids um but i can say that i have a good understanding of where kids come from and it's not a miracle um you actually did actually have to have sex or or find some method of conception um i i can understand that you would that people would um, immediately fall in love with their own ch children. That would, that's a biological imperative. We wouldn't be here if it didn't happen. Um, but I, I think what they're doing is conflating things that they don't understand and feelings that are overwhelming into um, a, a completely unjustified metaphysical claim. Uh, I, I, I can't imagine, I mean, no matter how much I possibly loved anything, that thing or my love for that thing in no way constitutes proof that a God exists. I, I, you just can't get from A to B. And I would, I would add that, uh, you know, we have a lot of atheist parents in this, in this group that, uh, for which that didn't happen. So I, I, I don't know how prevalent this thing is that you're claiming. Um, you know, it might, it, might, it might have some anecdotal things, but uh, I wouldn't say it's a general trend or anything. Okay. I would, I would doubt that. Okay. Well, that's all I had for you. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for your Appreciate call. Appreciate the call. Thank you. We need to actually turn that up just a smidgen next time. But So, <coughs> you know, yeah, maybe people buy into the notion that religion helps children. I mean, re a lot of religions are very family-oriented, and, um, you know, and, and that's a good thing, I guess, uh, right? And so y y they may be looking out for support for their family and raising children and you know giving them a relatively wholesome environment yeah. um, all of those things are good um, I, I'm always kind of reluctant to jump in on this as somebody who doesn't have any kids mm -hmm. but I do know people have kids I, I haven't grown up in a vacuum and I was a kid and I have friends who have kids and I have my brother has his kids I can tell you that when somebody has their first kid from what I've seen they're freaking terrified <laughs> they go a They've little crazy for a while yeah. the, the responsibility <laughs> for this 
this life. And, 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 and the moment it's born, one thing that happens is the realization that, holy crap, what did I do? I'm now responsible for another life. And I'm not equipped for that. I don't have all the answers. And then sometimes it's, it's better uh, or it's, it's seen as better to perhaps go for the easy answers. So the idea, I mean, I know, I know atheist parents who have, um, f for fear of, they don't want to raise an atheist child any more than they want to raise a, a Christian child. So they, they'd like to be able to do um, kind of a comparative religions, an introduction to all religions. But they also allow their kids um, to go to with, church with, with relatives. With, with older kids, right? This is no, what? young kids. Uh-huh. Okay. To go to church with relatives. You know, if grandma comes and wants to take little Johnny to church, then they let them go. Um, it, it's it's, okay. it's partially a freedom thing. Well, I can't imagine the church at all would be meaningful until you're like either five it's or six fun. or maybe even... It's fun? It's fun. Well, it's fun I, to be with the family and do something that they're doing. Yes, I, I can tell you when I was little... Pretty much part of being a kid, right? Um, when I was little, church was fun. Right down to the church bus stopping at McDonald's for cheeseburgers for everybody on the way back. <laughs> Um, you know, kid bait, huh? you get to sing and dance and play games and color, and it's like you know, uh, and 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 everybody there is on okay. the same page. So, so maybe the answer is free daycare, right? I mean, I, I think it, it's, there's a lot of things. There's or, or the price of your tithe or whatever. Right? There, there's certainly an aspect where they could just be overwhelmed and ready to glom onto anything that seems to provide uh, comfort, reassurance, um, even if they don't necessarily believe what's behind it the kind of community and camaraderie there, especially if you start going to daycares uh, or going to events with other people in your neighborhood who have just recently have kids, I, I, could see the, I could see them easily ending up, you know, uh, going to church and other social events mm -hmm. with them, so. Yeah. Well, we're live uh, today, uh, April 20th. Uh, we can put up the phone number, guys, if, uh, if uh, we have callers uh, that would like to call in, feel free to. Um, Otherwise, uh, I guess I can just hit a hit another little topic here. Sure. There's somebody on hold, but okay. We they don't just, know who. Just oh. Call. oh, go for it if you want. Okay. Is it Steve? Yeah. Hello. How you doing, Steve? Good. Uh, first of all, one thing about the uh, morality. Mm -hmm. I think morality. A lot of it is uh, whatever the people you are around you respect that you respect. That uh, a lot of your I. The sort of emotional idea of right and wrong just comes from what's accepted by the society that you're in. That's and, true. Uh, there, there, there's both. There, there are sort of there are some universals, uh, but but by and large, yeah, we are conditioned to to value certain things and and certain uh, aspects of morality get get more favor in, in different societies. So yes, so yeah. it, there is a strong component of societal norms. And I think that's where why people think it comes from religion. Basically, when people are surrounded or immersed in a religion, and that's what everybody points to, uh, saying certain things or acting a certain way or uh, upholding certain beliefs is considered moral, that actually becomes your morality just by your desire to be accepted by your community. And... Uh, that's that's a good point. Yeah, so it's playing out in a micro scale, right? Where you're you're saying that 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 effectively that that uh, the the social mores uh, of your church become your morality system, right? Is, is right. that, is that the it, point? But it's got nothing to do with being an absolute. If that's just what's around you. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are also theological claims that that God is the author of morality, and and those. Those uh, like the Pope who supposedly talk to God and have, have some sort of hotline that tells them, tells them what, what's moral and what's not moral, right? He's got a good hat. That's what he's got. <laughs> and some snappy red shoes. <laughs> right. But uh, I wanted to say something about, about uh, the one thing that ha I've seen happen that really bothers me is when uh, people are made to feel very, very ashamed of themselves. That's a, a thing that's sort of done by society to people, I guess, but it, it's something that people do on purpose to other people. Now, I consider to be often immoral. I mean, maybe there are people who have done things that deserve to be, they deserve to be ashamed of, but the shaming of somebody is a uh, often immoral act, and I think it's mostly done 
by people who think they are more moral than other people. And uh, it's an example of immorality, in my opinion, supported by often, you know, religious situations. Well, yeah, I mean, shaming people is, is a way uh, for a society to kind of punish people who are not participating in that society properly, right? So it's a very powerful tool, and like any other powerful tool, I think it can be misused, right? So you do sometimes see, I mean, sometimes shame's a good thing. I mean, uh, I think that, you know, our news, when it works properly, uh, shames politicians into doing the right thing many times. And I think that that's a good thing, right? Because, because we're, uh, you know, we elect them to serve us, and we want them to to do the right thing on our behalf, right? So it's not always a bad thing, but it can be misused. So and, and, I, and I've come on the show, you know, even in recent weeks, um, and and used this exact same tactic. Um, I think Monique Davis should have been ashamed of the comments that she made on the floor of the state legislature in Illinois. And I think Governor Perry, despite the fact that he was acting as a as a you know a, a citizen at the time, uh, he went on the Seven Hundred Club to promote his book. And I have no problem at all with the fact that he was expressing his opinion freely. Um, on, but there's a really fine line there. He is act, he's the governor of Texas. And when he goes on the 700 Club to say that secularism is a virus that is poisoning society, um, if he, you know, I realize he is speaking as a, as a free citizen as well, but um, I think that there's, he should be ashamed of himself. And there may, have, may, may in fact be need for an apology. Because if he'd gone on the 700 Club and said that Jews were a poison on society, I'm pretty sure the ACLU would have had him, you know, uh, called up and, and challenged on this. So while I don't think that... Well, it begs the question whether, whether someone with an opinion like that can, can reasonably represent all of Texans. Right. I, you know, I don't think he checks his religion at the door and he still has freedom of expression. On the other hand, um, it does raise concerns, as Don, as Don was saying, that if, you, if there's somebody who has this opinion... Um, about a you know a significant portion of his constituents, how effective can he be as governor? Whether he's he's relaying his real opinions or not, I mean, I have no doubt that he's re relaying his real opinions, um, and I, I think he deserves to be shamed for doing it. He probably does deserve to be. I I, I doubt if uh, you successfully shamed him. He's probably proud of the fact. That, oh, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I guess I just think of it as sort of proof of how it works as an emotional uh, mechanism as opposed to a rational mechanism that... It's kind of an can, emotional blackmail of some sort, right? Yeah, yeah and, you, and you, you can end up with someone who ends up being ashamed and feeling that way, even though they really didn't do anything that left alone they would think is bad or otherwise, but if the power of the desire for acceptance by a community can really form what somebody believes is right and wrong in a sense. Yeah, and that's, that's how cults, that's how cults uh, work, right? Is that they, they end up using mechanisms like that to control the people within their clutches. And I think religions use that to a lesser extent, yes, the larger I guess, religions. I guess, and regardless of what is considered to be moral or immoral, the fact that it works that way, I think, is proof that it's not an absolute list of morals. It's an interaction of people feeling each other's acceptance or rejection of their activities, and that is pretty much what's going on. I mean, yeah. it's very clear. I, I think you got a really good point there. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having a great show. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Thank Steve. you, Steve. We got... Uh, yeah, let's keep taking calls. We'll, we'll keep going. We got Scott. How you doing? Hey, how you doing, Matt? Good. Yeah, I love watching this show. I don't have the privilege of watching it live, and I don't know if you've talked about this already, but... Ben Stein's new movie, Expelled. Yeah, I, I saw it Friday. We we've been following that whole controversy. Yeah, I think I saw you mention it once or twice. I just wanted to know how you how you felt about it in terms of, like I have uh, I'm up here at the University of Missouri at, on a college campus, and I'm I have a lot of friends who like really. You, yeah. you do know that I'm from Missouri. Oh uh, no, I just. I just found your show. Actually, I saw a clip off of YouTube once, and um, yeah. it was like this 10-minute long thing where you're going back with one of these guys who's trying to, like, um, pretend that he's, you know, not a fundy or so. He's like, uh, the, um, like, it takes just as much faith to believe that God doesn't exist type of thing. Right. He, you know, and then, like, after um, dealing with him for 10 minutes, he was, like, he, he was like, oh, why don't I just come down there and punch you in or something? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm originally from place. Missouri. My, my folks live in the Kansas City area. My brother and, and sister-in-law and their kids live in the St. Louis area. So I, I, I hit both sides of the state. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm but, from St. Louis area so, myself. So you, you were asking about uh, expelled and... Yeah, I, I wanted to... Um, what I wanted to ask was, what's just, um, do you think it's a better reaction to it to go see it so that I can discuss it with those friends? You, you know, because I have a friend who saw it at... See, I think that Crew is a national organization. I, Campus Crusade for Christ. Right. I, they actually did a free showing, and I would have seen it there if I knew about it. But I was asking, do you think I should go and pay to see it and essentially support this thing financially, or do you think I should just boycott it? And uh, what do you feel is a better response? We, we've we, we've heard both both. I, uh, I'm not a fan of boycotting. I'm not a fan of boycotting the movie because it draws attention to it that it doesn't deserve. It, I, I'm also not a fan of paying to see it, even though I did it Friday because I'm in a position where I know I'm going to have to talk about it probably on this show and on nonprofits, specifically some of the arguments that come up in the movie. Honestly, I, I don't think it's worth the time and effort, and I think you can find out everything you need to know about Expelled from reading reviews and discussions about it online. Um, but, you know, it's, it's up to you what you want to do. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I, I mean, say, I said boycotting. In reality, I'm not going. Wouldn't be like you know, <laughs> big like you know demonstrations or whatever. Right, you know, I'd yeah. just be like you know. Oh, I, I'd like prefer that and they I would just, you know, decide that we would not be seeing it to, you know, support it that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. So but, I would add a little nuance to what Matt just said. I would say that if you are in a position where you feel that you need to argue with the premise of the movie or or debate the movie. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no substitute for seeing it. I mean, if if uh, someone is debating something and they haven't seen it, uh, it's, it just is like a, an easy way to, for right. them to, to nail you and say, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, right? Yeah, you, so if I you're, mean, yeah, yeah, I'm if you're in a position I'm where you need judging it, right? <laughs> if you're in a position where you need to argue, go see it. Yeah, I I, I went and saw. I'd rather that they never got a penny of my money, um, but they did, and I went and saw it for the same reason that I occasionally go to church. Because <laughs> I don't want somebody to be able to call up and say, well, you have no idea what you're talking about. Well, yeah, actually, well, I, I do. I certainly would have expected you to go see it. I mean, you know, you're on TV every week, and you're going to, you get all these guys. Uh, with great in. power I mean, comes great responsibility. It, yes, I'm Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cast my web and drag you all to hell with me. No, thanks a lot for calling in, Scott. I appreciate it. And uh, Thank if, you. You, if you do, uh, if you do see it, um, you know, feel free to at least, I don't know, make a post somewhere, send an email. Uh, if, if, you're, if you end up wasting your money on it, make sure that it doesn't become a waste and that you, you point out the flaws that you see because there's always a chance that somebody's going to notice something that everybody else missed. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, it's, it's almost like you're getting as powerful as Oprah. You know, you got to... <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> and as soon as Oprah gives me a few million dollars, I'll be sure and pass it along to the rest of you. Right. Yeah, that's worth mentioning. I mean, none, none of us, this is a completely volunteer effort. None of us makes a penny off of this. We do this because we, we believe in it being a good thing. We're trying to educate. We're part of this, part of this ACA, and we're trying to educate people on, on religious issues. So. so back to what you were saying. <laughs> Okay. Well, we were talking about God-based moralities, and um, I, we just talked about God-based moralities as being kind of con games and why that is. And I want to make another point that God-based moralities create a conflict of interest with human needs. So, so assuming that God exists and He's all-powerful, then pleasing Him will enable you to reap the eternal rewards of some sort, going to heaven or or, you know, virgins or whatever, right? Um, so why not please him at the expense of your fellow man? Because like Pascal's wager, you know, why not maximize your, your, your outcome in this, right? Why not screw you somebody over if it helps you get to heaven, right? So you're effectively using your fellow man as a means to an end. So we can give a whole bunch of examples of this. I'm going to hit on them quickly, and if anybody wants to talk about them further, please call in. One big moral issue is overpopulation, right? God says in the Bible, go forth and multiply. Well, we have a finite amount of resources on the earth, 
right? Something's got to give somewhere, right? And this is generally means there's going to be famine and disease and these sorts of things to cut the population back. Um, so you can't, you can't overpopulate the earth, even though the Bible will never change. The Bible will always say, go forth and multiply. Uh, combine this with uh, death to the infidel. Why not kill people who are going to go to hell anyway, right? Why not send them to hell and make your religion better? I mean, we, that's what we have in the suicide bombers. Um, we have those in holy wars. Uh, here's another one. If Jesus is coming any day now, why mess with the environment? Why try to make the environment better? Why save it? Why worry about greenhouse gases? He'll fix it when he comes, right? It'll all be perfect. It'll all be wonderful. Also, why not make this thing happen faster and have a holy war in the Middle East and, and get Israel in there and, and, and trigger all those prophecies in the Bible, supposed prophecies? Why not bring on our, our Armageddon? I personally call this Christian snuff porn, right, because it's, 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 it's getting off on the fact that, that the world is going to be trashed in order for you to, to have your orgasm with Jesus or whatever, right? So, so that's, how, that's what I think of it. Here's some other examples of selling out uh, your fellow man for belief in God. Honor killings, right? Killing someone because they, uh, they you know, defiled God or whatever, right? Your, 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 sister, your sister looked at another man, therefore she's impure and she needs to be killed. This happens in Islam. Uh, female genital mutilation is a religiously based thing. Uh, killing apostates and witches and witch burnings and uh, all these trials and such. Torturing people into claiming belief. The conquest, the crusades, forcing women to bear children they can't support. Uh, promoting ignorance about sex, and so on, and so on, and so on. Right. So there's lots of these things where where, where religions sell out a fellow man. So if God is more important, then why not uh, cause suffering in other people to please your God if that makes your God happy? Unfortunately, nobody really knows what God says or what God is, and and they project whatever they want onto onto God. So you know, it's all just screwing the other guy to benefit God and hopefully yourself. So you want to take a few more calls? That, that was my next little, little spiel. Sure, we can, we can go on. Is it Al? Yeah. Hey, how Al. you doing? Uh, well, I just had a uh, comment about uh, you know, morality and, and the military mm -hmm. and, that, and that, you know, all through, uh, well, you know, all through the millennia, you know, humans have have killed other humans uh, in the name of not only uh, religion, but you know, and for the state and for you know for uh, for uh, tribal reasons and everything like that. Or resources, uh, right? And uh, but in the military, like, and I was in the military. I was in the Marine Corps during Vietnam, and I went to Vietnam, and the military. Uh, you know, they, they have chaplains in the military, and there's a lot of, a lot of career military people that, that are very deeply religious. And I always found, I always thought, what, the, what, is, what is that about? Because, you know, here you are in this, in this institution that is for killing. You, you kill other people, and right. you're given orders to do that. And I thought... Well, maybe they're religious because when you, you know, you take somebody's life, you know, that's, that's, that's like you take everything that person had, no matter whether they're the, you know, you know who they are, whether they're Korean or Vietnamese or, or an Arab or what, you take everything from that person, that, right. that person that ever had. Then you have, to, you have to see what you did, and I guess, I mean, I never killed anybody. You know, and I hope I never do. But you see this that you, what you've done, and so you have somehow you have to ju you know you have to forgive yourself for what you did. And so I guess using religion, using God, you know, uh, because you know thou shalt not kill, but thou shalt not kill except if you know President Bush tells you to. Right. So, well, I've seen it go both ways. I've seen uh, people who are uh, have go through the trials of war, who come out uh, more religious, right? Because it, it it restores their faith in humanity or restores their faith 
or it shores it up. And I've also seen people who, who, who come out more or less, less and less believing in the sense of, you know, how can a just God create a situation like this? So I, I, it seems to polarize people. Um, you know, I think faith for many people ends up being a tool by which they, they cope with these sorts of situations. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's also a tool to create some of these situations Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. I, and, That's and what not we're to, about. I think you brought up you know, an interesting topic. I'm happy to talk about it. But I, I also happen to think that um, the morality, the moral issue of, of you know, killing with regard to warfare and everything is completely separate of anybody's religious beliefs. I mean, an atheist could be um, both a complete pacifist opposed to killing anybody ever or <laughs> still consider life you know, uh, uh, sacred, but think that there's justified situations True. in which you'd kill True. people. So, well, in warfare, um, I mean, if I wanted to be, it's, if it's I certainly wanted more to complex really, than just really simply cynical, religion. I would say that man is 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 not much more than a naked killer ape, because we <laughs> yeah. we slaughtered each other. We're we're good at that. That's for and, sure. And and not only that, but we have we have. We have caused the demise of countless species of animals and plants through our actions. But oh, yeah. we have having, just enough intelligence that, to be dangerous. That, man does. I mean, <laughs> man makes music, and that's one of the beautiful things man does. So, uh, uh, I just think that uh, I think it's just a kind of a, a dichotomy how how the military uh, can be be what it is. And yet, uh, and, that, and I guess that's just the way humans are. You know, we have to have some kind of something to stand on when we do terrible things. I, I don't know. Yeah. Personally, I, you know, I, I'm an agnostic atheist. So, you know, I, I believe in what I see and what I touch. I'm sitting in my house. I'm, I know I'm sitting on a couch because I can feel I'm sitting on a couch. And that's kind of how I am. I mean, I'm more reality based, you know. And so, anyway. Well, but I had one other. I had one other question. I don't know if you guys can can uh, uh, comment it on today. Maybe on another program. But all the hype about the Pope being in America was kind of kind of humorous to me this past week. So, right. that's but a, anyway, that's a lovely that's, tangent. That's, I think the thing that that I found most offensive about the whole thing was I read a, a, an article about where he had a meeting with some people who'd been uh, abused by priests. And I had, apologize? To, I had to read it twice because they were apologizing to him. No. <laughs> I, I kid you not, I wasn't gonna talk about this today I'm, uh, and I probably won't hit on it too much. I, I'm so, I, I quit smoking yesterday so I'm already a little irritable. Um, but uh, I can't believe that's that's terrible. They that's apologized terrible. to him. They went up and were like, you know, Holy Father, please forgive us. We've hated you and your church for so long because of what these other people did to me. This is the guy who, under Pope John Paul, set up a policy to shuffle these assholes around, right, right. to hide them from the law. Well, to work in opposition to efforts to find out who these pedophile priests were. And these victims are apologizing to him? Right. What bizarro well, universe are we living in? <laughs> all right. Well, you guys, I guess I'm going to have to have a beer now. So, anyway. Yeah. Thank, thanks a lot. Thanks Thank for you. the program. Thanks, Al. Appreciate the call. Okay. Bye. Yeah, I well, think that's that's got to be one of the most offensive things I've ever yeah. heard. Well, then he's blaming the bishops for mishandling it. It's like, well, he they they did what he told them to do. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's pretty pretty jaw dropping. It's it's truly amazing. It it shows it shows the power of religion to corrupt and control people's minds. That not only were these people victims because of policies within this religion, but it it still maintained such a hold on them that they felt the need to apologize. I mean, not only should the church be apologizing to them. They should be getting paid, and and as Bill Maher said on on uh, uh, real time a couple two weeks ago, if the Pope were the head of a chain of daycares that had thousands of employees who'd been accused and and and, and evidence Victim, showing yeah. that they had been molesting little children, he'd be in jail right now. And and Bill Maher is exactly right. And some of us have been saying it for years. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, I, on the one hand, uh, I'm I'm busy being irritated by. Um, these 
12 and 13 year old girls that they're pulling out of this compound in Texas who are turning up pregnant because they got married off to these 50 year old perverts. And now we've got the Pope in town and they've managed to get people to apologize. I'm pretty sure that these little girls are gonna stand up in court and say, no, 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 but I really love my aged husband and whatever will I do if he's not here to knock me up again? It's a, it, this is the crazy world that we live in. And, and, and yet we are the ones who uh, our, our good morals, governor right? says are the, are the virus that's poisoning society. No, sorry. And for well, those well, of you who listen to the nonprofits, he blamed, he blamed the secular. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and and for the nonprofits listeners who Didn't are listening to have anything to do with the priests themselves. Yeah. Listening to Athe Experience today, um, they're both asshats. They're so, both drink. Asshats. Drink. Yeah. Have a drink with for us. So um, anyway, hey, uh, you got he, more. He had a, he had another another sort of tangent that I wanted to hit on real quick. Sure. And he asked, well, you know, why are these Christians in the military? And I think. I think that for a lot of people, and many of whom happen to be Christians, they're attracted to power, and they want to be where power is. And I think that that's the appeal of, of God and religion for many people, is they want to be part of this power structure. And if you're you know, in the military, you get, to, you get to have both. You get to have the religion, and you get to have the power of the military there. And I, I think- You might think, think that when the recruiter's talking to you, when you get in, at least from my experience, you don't, well, you don't yeah. really have a lot of power. I mean, you, you do on occasion and you can eventually get to well, where you have it's a power structure, power. right? Uh, both, it, both what it is, is it's, it's organized and it's set up, um, it's a structured lifestyle that some people benefit from. It is kind of family oriented, especially in times of war. You've got this whole, kinship and brotherhood and band of brothers and and that type of thing going on so there's a family aspect to it as well so i mean I th there's lots of different reasons that, that that it would appeal to different people and and even though i was completely different at the time that i joined and and served um, than i am now um, i'm still not in any way opposed to it i I'd consider it again you know mm -hmm. there's a lot of good benefits there as well but you know i i saw an interview during um the root of all evil bonus interviews where he's talking to this woman who's a therapist, who's, uh, uh, who's worked with some people who've come out of cults. Um, she herself had come out of a, an, a cult. And she mentioned that one of the things that they often do um, is immediately go find some other group to join. And sometimes it ends up being a church that is slightly less cultish than the one they left. And sometimes it's the military. And sometimes it is some other organization that provides them with all the structure that all of the fellowship and structure that they had but hopefully, you know, it's kind of like they're weaning themselves off of the cult part. So we, we, one can only hope. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so shall I do my last little rant here? And uh, oh, please. Why, don't you, why don't you say where we're going to dinner a little later? Okay. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for not flashing it red on the screen to remind me that I haven't mentioned <laughs> okay. it in an hour. I beat him to it. After the program's over, we're on for another 31, 30 minutes exactly right now. Okay. Um, we'll be going to El Arroyo on 5th Street. The address is up on your screen. We get there around 5 o'clock, and we'll be there till 7. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to join us. You, I don't care what you believe as long as you're not coming down there to cause problems. You can come down and have a good discussion and a meal and, uh, and ask questions that you didn't want to ask on the air. So we look forward to seeing you there. Yeah, and we have a, a lot of uh, crew here and, and a f quite a f number of folks in the live audience, so we're, uh, we had a big, big group here already. Actually, we, we got one more call I think we can take real quick okay. before you do your rant. Is it Kenneth? Yeah, hey, this is Ken. How you doing, Ken? Uh, I noticed you guys were talking about Bill Maher. I probably don't agree with Bill Maher on very many things, but I do have to agree with him on this religion. Hope yeah, I'm, he nailed it. I'm hit or miss on what I agree with Bill Maher. And basically, yeah, when, he, here. When, he, when he's sane, I agree with him, and when he's insane, I don't. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. When he starts talking about, but you one know, thing you don't I do agree medicine. with him, I've seen him uh, mention it a couple of times. He's on Larry King a lot. He is right on the religion, hocus pocus BS. You know. Yep. I have to agree with him on that. And uh, I enjoy. I just called in and say I enjoy you guys' show. I've been watching this uh, since so oh, Madeline Murray was on there. She kept the flame alive for a while. She was kind of out there on a lot of things too. But I agreed with her on the religion part. Yeah, I wish I'd had a chance to meet her. I was, I was. A yeah, I never did meet her either, but uh, I used to watch her show. Yeah, okay. and there's some people, you know, still around uh, ACA and around you know, that we know that were, that were part of that show early on. Although we're a completely different group from. Uh, yeah, group exactly. Now. But uh, anyway, at least somebody's doing it, you know. 
because yeah. I just don't understand this religion. I mean, I watch these uh, infomercials and stuff at night, and they have these, you know, third-rate preachers on there, and I don't see how they, how anybody could could buy into that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> there's a fair amount of it on public access too. You know, you you think that would be more of a deterrent than than than, than you guys, you know? Just have them tune in and watch some of these miracle healers at night, and yeah. if that doesn't convince you that it's a you know, it's used car salesman all the way. Then I, yeah. I don't know what what would you know. I'm not I'm not quite sure why they view me as so scary. Um, mostly, I think because they're afraid to call in and, and debate. But uh, it's it's kind of insane to to think that they could watch somebody dancing around claiming to to heal people by you know Absolutely. touching their forehead and it's yet just, it's object just when I when I talk about reason and evidence. And, and the harm that religion does. So, in fairness, religion has done a lot of good things over it the years. It has, it has. I, I agree with that. And there's not a single piece of good thing that religion's ever done that couldn't have also been done without religion. That's true, too. I, I have to we agree with that. We don't need it. It's the individual more than it is any kind of, you know, yep. faith-based, uh, you know, run down and, and listen to some guy in some robes. The good people the, who, You know, some fairy tales that were... Yeah. The good people who have, who have the degree of empathy and the degree of compassion that allows them to volunteer time at a soup kitchen would still yeah, volunteer exactly, at that same soup yep, kitchen, exactly whether it was right. run by a church or American atheists, because they're doing it to help people. Yep. Well, I, I certainly, let me uh, get off the phone here and turn you back on here so I can watch the rest of your show. Enjoy it, fellas. Okay. All right. Good Thanks, deal. Ken. All right. Appreciate bye-bye. It. Okay, well, I guess I'll do my last little spiel here. We were sure. talking about God-based morality and, uh, and what, what could be wrong with God-based morality. And the third and thing I wanted to... What could be right with it. What could be right with it, right. Well, uh, the third thing I wanted to point out is that God-based moralities very often promote a broken model of the world that inhibits uh, effective action. Okay, so for example, in the case of a natural disaster, we have a tsunami or we have an earthquake or whatever, Everybody comes out and says, God this, God this, We're, they're punishing so-and-so. And if God is punishing somebody with this, with this supernatural act, this act of God, as they call it, why would you rush in to help? Why would you piss off your God? Right? Why would you help these people out if, if, if the supreme creator of the universe thought that these people should be trashed? Yeah. Right? So you, doing so, you might, you might anger God. Right? There was a similar thinking uh, with lightning rods. It's like, well, lightning is God's uh, choosing something. He is showing his anger at somebody. And if you put up a lightning rod, you're, it's blasphemous, right? And uh, eventually uh, they kind of all turned around and all the churches now have lightning rods. It's like, <laughs> yeah. oops, maybe they were wrong on that. With prayer, uh, I think prayer is like masturbation. It, it only makes you feel good. Um, <laughs> prayer is prayers for okay. For, we've had a couple examples here recently where where parents had sick children and they prayed for the kids and did nothing medically for those kids and the kids died. You know the other way that it's like masturbation is that you should do it at home <laughs> in your closet and not in public <laughs> schools, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or, or at least go to the bathroom. Right, <laughs> hide out somewhere. Right, so so. This, this notion that prayer is helpful is, is wrong. It's, it's been proven wrong. There's a study done, a big study done by the Templeton Foundation, which incidentally is religiously funded to prove that religion or prayer does nothing. Prayer, prayer has no effect in the real world. And so if you're relying on prayer to, to heal yourself or you heal your sick kid, you're, you're, it's a crapshoot. You're, you're, you're going to get what you're going to get without God because God isn't there. Um, and if you kill your children doing this, then you know maybe you deserve to go to jail, or maybe your your church needs to be shut down for promoting uh, false false crap. It's not a charity. Okay, so that's prayer. So uh, here's another one: if our bodies are just soul traps, you know, are just containers for soul, where the purpose is to release our soul so that it can go be with God and and glory, glory, hallelujah, then death is no big deal. Uh, killing is not so bad. Killing a body is, is no big deal. So, therefore, you end up devaluing human life based on the supernatural concept. Um, we have uh, three examples of the suppression of science. I'll hit those real quick. We have Galileo and his looking up at the stars was blasphemy because you're looking up God's skirt or whatever. 
and and you know you're not allowed to look at that but it turned out that he had uh, you know some views of the solar system that were that were challenging the the dogma right and because we go out and look at the solar system and look at reality for what it is we've learned a lot more than we could, ever could have learned from a holy book we learned nothing from a holy book uh, promotion of intelligent design this ben stein movie right uh, id uh, intelligent design opens the door for god right it allows you to believe in god but it doesn't it doesn't help mankind at all right it has it had it has given us no scientific predictions no scientific uh papers out of it no no results of any benefit to mankind no technologies have come from it no lives have been saved no crops have been you know aided by it so it's it's totally useless so if you teach intelligent design or you open that door instead of something real something that benefits people you you're you're wasting the time you are you're effectively shooting yourself in the foot and that's one of the reasons we object for it is it is it has no value whatsoever except it opens the door for god and who needs god uh, cloning and stem cell research. If cells are human beings and or have souls and they're more important than real human beings, then then you're going to make bad decisions that that are going to harm real human beings. Um, one solution to the stem cell thing is to is to label the 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 cures that comes out of stem cell research and the people who are opposed to it and make sure they don't come in contact with each other. Very simple solution, right? So people who who are against stem cell research don't get any benefit from it. That's, it seems perfectly okay with me and let everybody else benefit from it. Um, so that's, uh, that's some of the suppression of science. Uh, another thing that, that comes out of this, this, this religion is the notion that suffering is somehow a virtue, right? We're, we're, we're all fawning over the suffering of Jesus or Mother Teresa really was kind of a sadist. She ran a so-called clinic that uh, that basically people came in to die and they were led there to suffer. Now people thought somehow that she was doing good and gave her a bunch of money. So she had millions of dollars in the bank, and she was withholding any analgesics or any cures for these people. And she was in there thinking this is just the greatest thing in the world. They're getting kisses from Jesus, and they're all going to they're dying in pain. And boy, isn't this wonderful? And I think that's really twisted. I think that's very twisted. And Mother Teresa, you know, if you think she was doing good, you know, you better take take another look at that. Well, without fail, every time I, I you know, not not to be pick on Christian Christianity Day, um, although you we've, know, we've hit Islam on a few things more more often than not. It's the one we're familiar with. It's the one the callers are referencing, and so I have no problem at all banging on it. Um, but inevitably, when I talk to to Christians who who claim that they are so for moral reasons, um, what I find is that they have this incredibly twisted sense of what is moral and what is not moral. Hmm. It is, I mean, just uh, obscene in some areas and absurd in others. And we had a, a young lady write in on the website, and we got to talking about this, and one of the things she brought up was that... Um, she didn't want to live in a world where, you know, people got away with things. Those who did wrong needed to be punished. Those, those people um, who were, you know, uh, pedophiles, they needed to be punished. And since man's law is fallible and some people will escape that punishment, she instead preferred to believe Christianity where those people are going to be judged. Um, sorry, but not only is that a yeah. stupid reason for believing something, um, because it says nothing about whether or not it's true. The world you want to live in or what you find comfortable has no bearing on what world you're really living in. But when you adopted that particular religion, you gave up any hope of justice because those same pedophiles that have escaped man's law get to escape God's law too. They're all eligible for an eternity in paradise. All they have to do is repent, be saved, do whatever the requirement is for salvation. And meanwhile, those people get to go on to eternal paradise, and people like me are either punished forever or destroyed because we don't believe, because there's one and only one unforgivable sin, and that's doubt. That's a thought crime. There's no justice in this system. What you have is capriciousness. What you have is arbitrary. A God picks and chooses who it's going to save 
um, based on, in some cases, on deeds, and in some cases, on faith, and in some cases, on, you know, what day of the week is it, uh, whatever, whatever kind of arbitrary decision can be made. I wrote something that I read on the nonprofits that I'm not going to read today. It's entirely too long. Um, but th there were some points made in there. Um, you haven't accepted, if you've accepted like Christianity on a, on a sense of justice, you haven't accepted a cosmic sense of justice that alleviates the problem. You've accepted one that you believe alleviates the problem for you. It's a selfish justification that shows no regard for real matters of justice. It's the height of arrogance and your desire to feel special because somebody up there thinks you're special. Well, according to the paradigm you advocate, he thinks anyone willing to worship him is special with no regard for justice or character. That's the whole system. Don't pretend like there's justice here. It's, it's, a, it's a favoritism club thing, and you're on the inside because you're special. But don't pretend like, you know, there, that there's some divine justice to this, because there's not. It's insane. There are mass murderers that, according to your belief system, are enjoying paradise forever, while good people who simply didn't believe or believed wrongly um, are roasting forever. It's not justice. It's crazy. <laughs> That's sucking up to power is what it is, right? Ooh, you are so big. Ooh, you are. <laughs> Let me worship you, please. I want to be a slave. Right. That's what you are. You, you, you're sacrificing <laughs> your own mental freedom and your own ability to make decisions and your own ability to determine what is true morality and what isn't. And you're giving all that up so you can be a slave. And you want to be a slave, evidently, forever. Because I can't think of any redeeming quality about a, a heaven where you're, you know, spending eternity in servility. It's, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. So that was Be Curious on our website? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I tussled with him or her for quite a while myself and got frustrated. <laughs> yeah. I, so we, my, we, the have, a, really we have a little bulletin board on our website that people can, uh, without much uh, entry fee, come and, come and you know. The, po the post is really post your, kind of Post long. your comments and that sort of thing. But yeah. uh, there's, there's some interesting reading there. Um, uh, so let me wrap this up, and then we can go back to callers. Okay. Um, we were talking about, you know, God-based morality gives you a broken model of the world, and I, I just can't t touch this broken model of the world without, without hitting an article that, I, that I've plugged a number of times. It's called uh, Cross-National Correlations of Quantifiable Social Health Societal health with popular religiosity and secularism in the prosperous democracies. Which is a really long-winded way of saying, is there any evidence that religion does anything really good for society? Right. So it looks at, it looks at uh, different uh, societies and their rates of religious belief and their rates of various social ills like homicides, youth suicide, infant mortality, life expectancy, STDs, abortions, and teen pregnancies. <coughs> and... What you find when you look at this is that secular societies do better on all these things yeah. than, than religious societies. So this really begs the question of, you know, if you've got God, this omniscient God that wants all this good stuff to happen on your side and you can talk with him and all these things, why aren't religious-based societies much better off? Why, why, why is it the case that these secular societies that are using reason and, and puzzling things out and and, and going after things directly and, and using logic and science. Why do they do so much better? So I just, I just have to ask that question. I would, I'm, you know, I'm going to ask that every couple months or so, and hopefully somebody sometime will answer that for me. I, I Call me up and answer, answer yeah. it. So having, having a broken model of the world stands in the way of, of reason, stands in the way of effective decision-making, of actually doing moral action once you decide to do it. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it inhibits your ability to, to solve the problems that you're really trying to solve. So, so to, to wrap up here, religious-based moralities, they're arbitrary, and therefore they're like con games, and they're used as con games very often. They create a conflict of interest with human needs with, with a pretend or real God. And they're based on a broken model of the world that inhibits moral action. So, so when, when somebody asks me, <laughs> how can you be moral without God, I, I, wanted, I want to answer back, you know, how can we be moral with all these problems with religious-based moralities? So, Yeah, I mean, if you've got a God-based moral system that, that you think is, you know, better or flawless or whatever, I'd, I'd love to know about it. We've got about 
Uh, a little less than 15 minutes left on the show. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and take calls for the rest of the time as long as they're coming in. So the number's up on your screen. Um, there's a couple people waiting right now. Um, as a reminder, I want to. There's a couple things coming up that I think we need to push more, and and that is that uh, May 1st is the National Day of Reason. I mentioned that at the beginning. For people in the Austin area who'd like to participate in that, you can go to the ACA website for more information. And as we get more information about you know times and meeting places, we'll have that up as well. Um, and for ACA members, um, just in case any of you tuned in later missed the announcements, uh, as a reminder, the election is coming up. Uh, ACA elections for the board of directors the first Sunday in May. There's information at the website on that as well. Anybody who doesn't get through on the telephone or doesn't want to can email tv at atheist-community.org. Please include something in the subject line like AETV or NPR or something along those lines. NPR for nonprofits so, radio. For nonprofits radio. Yeah. Uh, so that you can get through the, the spam filters um, because we're, we're getting slammed on some of them. But okay. Is it Chuck? Yeah. How you doing, Chuck? Just fine. Uh, yeah, I was wanting to know. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, with all the, you know, the popes over here now and traveling around. There's just one. And, and, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. and um, uh, the um, uh, uh, the you know presidential election coming up, and and they're all talking about how religious they are and everything. <sighs> and um, yeah. uh, I'm just wondering, you know, every time I turn on the television, or every time I turn on the, or, or uh, you know, open up the newspaper, I, I'm seeing the Pope, or I'm seeing something about, you know, somebody's religion, and I, and I just they're. I'm just wondering if are there any numbers, uh, you know, that that would identify how many people out there actually go to church? Yeah, you know, because uh, it, it's it's like uh, it, just by looking at the news and the uh, uh, newspaper, you'd think that you know this whole country uh, goes to church every Sunday. And, you know, I got yeah, to think well, about it. I don't off, know a single person who yeah. goes to church. There's a lot. Our media, especially the statesman, has a, a strong kind of religious slant to it. Um, and this, is, this has to do with, I don't know if you're ever familiar with Chomsky filtering. It, it basically is that there's decisions made at various levels by the owners and by the editors and so on to filter out a lot of things that, that they think won't sell papers or won't, uh, will piss off people and piss off their advertisers or whatever, right? Uh -huh. And so, and they've 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 given and I've I've complained to the paper and interacted with them and and they give um, a lot of there, there's whole column inches given to promoting faith, but there's there's nothing promoting reason, and they're they're very they're very much loath to publish stories where religion gets criticized or faith gets criticized. And I've, I've written a, a couple articles on our website about that. So, so this is one thing that's going on: is is that there's there's a there's a sort of a a false uh, a characterization of of what our society is like through the papers and such. And then you also get people playing mind games like, oh, you know, I really believe in X Y Z. When they answer the poll, they say that. And 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 like with sex surveys. There's a lot of uh, sort of self-deception that goes on, a lot of mind games that people play when they answer these questions. They don't want to be seen as atheists because they think atheism is bad, even though they may have a lot of doubts, right? And right. so they may, they may actually answer certain ways because of the stigma associated with, with doubt. And, um, and I think that poll takers, by and large, haven't done a very good job of exploring these nuances. I don't think they take nearly as much care with religious surveys as they do with sex surveys, where this is a notorious problem of getting accurate results. I think, I think the, the, sec, the uh, religious surveys, they're happy to have high numbers of religion. And, and yes, there, and there, are, there are some studies where people don't, don't go to church very much. And, um, um, but but they, they don't get much news, and they don't, they don't show up in the news very much. And you have to search them out. Well, did, did you see here just, uh, I think it was last month, and I, I meant to save it and I forgot to, uh, but it was, there was an article, some university did a study, a 10-year study, and it was, their results were that over the last 10 years, uh, a uh, very large number of uh, Americans 
had moved away from religion. Do, yeah, do, and, do and you, there's a number of people switched from one religion to another. Well, no, they've just moved away from uh, right. believing in mm -hmm. God. You know, be, by becoming atheists, I guess. Yeah, the category called nuns or none of the above uh, is is getting very big. It's it's these are people that don't identify with specific religious traditions. Now you have to actually subdivide this ca this cat this category is about what 16, 15 percent, and it's getting bigger. Um, but within this category are people that might have God beliefs and who don't have God beliefs. So uh, very often you'll see this broken down into people who claim to be atheists and agnostics and, and so on. But this, this nuns people are basically people that have sort of given up on religion as a thing. They may still have beliefs and they may still read the Bible, they may still do whatever, but they're, they're given up on the formal religion thing. And I think that that's a very interesting trend that's going on in the United States, that, that, that basically... Uh, you know, religions are having a little tough time, tougher time selling their wares, I think. Yeah, well, they're, they're definitely, the Catholic Church, since all their homosexual, uh, you know, their homosexual problems, they're definitely on the blitz to, uh, you know, to, to get well, members. Well, a lot of Protestant churches are having trouble, too, you know, like... Yeah, uh, well, they should, yeah. Ted like, Haggy. I, I, that's and, why I'm saying, you know, the... Uh, or, uh, I don't know Hager. anybody who goes to church, and See, but I, every time I turn on the TV, it's uh, you know they make it look like this this whole country uh, goes to church every Sunday. And uh, yeah. another thing, yeah. these, these uh, uh, politicians, you know, they they pander to these churches, and oh, definitely. W with with uh, uh, yeah. Obama here, he's been you know they uh, holding the fire to him over uh, what his preacher said. And uh, you know, and so all these politicians are getting in line, saying, "Oh well, I'm uh, I'm Christian, I'm God fearing, I'm you know, I'm I'm religious." Yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I, religion. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the the our forefathers were smart enough to say we're going to separate uh, uh, church and state, and they had a uh, a very good reason for doing that. And and, oh, yeah, and and I think that we, we should you know we need to make sure that we keep church and state separate, especially since the church doesn't even pay any taxes. Why in the hell would they have any say at all? What's going on in you know in, not the, in politics? To. Yeah, they're not yeah. supposed to. Well, and they shouldn't. You know, like, like you said, what has the church ever done? You know. Uh, for anybody, I mean, they've never come up with any kind of good idea. In the, fact, the only they've had churches, nothing but bad ideas. The only reason churches are tax exempt is because they used to have a bunch of money and they used to run the world. Right. This exactly. is a leftover. This is a remnant of when they had all the control. They still got all the money, right? or at least huge chunks of it, flipping great watches of cash. But uh, we, we, it's, it's, it's this tradition. It's. Oh, you know, surely everybody just knows that religion does good things for society, so we'll give them a, a, cl a clean slate with regard to paying taxes. Uh, no, actually, I no longer think that that's the case. I think it may have been a case at some point when religion was primarily responsible for education of people. Um, but guess what? We've now secularized schools. We no longer need the churches for schools. Um, and I think that every church or any organization, church or not, that wants a tax exemption should have to have public records and make a showing that they're doing something in the public interest that makes them deserving of a tax break. Not yeah. just, hey, we're the new Methodist church on the block, so we're tax-free. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and also, uh, you know, there's something else that I've noticed, um, in, in, especially with the Republican Party. Uh, uh, I listen to a lot of uh, these Republican talk radio, and and they're talking a, an awful lot about how this war in Iraq is. The whenever I listen to them talk, it sounds like they're uh, making it Christians against Muslims, <laughs> and so they're they're trying to make it into a whole. I, I mean, that's the impression that I'm getting. Is, yeah, you know, right. I, I'm, I'm hearing, this is what I'm hearing, it's holy war. 
Yeah, and that's not a good thing. I mean, and, I, I, well, but people, let me, people let me have add no this. idea how ugly holy wars can be. Yeah, right? well, well, <laughs> let me add this. See, I think what's going on is they're they're see our our we're, we're going to be in Iraq for a long time, but the problem is right now is they're um, we don't have the draft. See, so they don't have as many people. Are, aren't, aren't as many people joining as, yeah, as they were originally. Yeah, it's a recruiting mechanism, right? a recruiting mechanism. Right, yeah. and so they're, they're trying to uh, use this religious uh, scam to uh, get more people to, uh, to uh, you know, join the, the armed forces. And I, I think that, uh, you know, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, I don't care. But uh, I think that if it doesn't work, and if they have to uh, turn to the draft, I think you're going to see. Uh, I, I well, think we're going to have a the big draft, problem. The war will be over pretty quick, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to have a <laughs> big problem if they have to start drafting people, yeah. because uh, you know they're going to find out. Uh, you, you know, it, it, there's not going to be any uh, be, uh, juggling the numbers here, right. because e either they're going to show up for the draft or they're not, so, and uh, yeah. that's. You know that that'll be the you know that'll be the answer. We we got to stop you here, Chuck. Okay. Thanks for the call. We're running low on time. Appreciate it. All right. Can I Bye. can I interject something here? Sure. Uh, there was a very funny news story from Britain that, that that applies to some of the comments made in the last call. I wanted to to hit on it real quick here. Fortune tellers, mediums, and spiritual healers marched at the home of the British Prime Minister and at Downing Street on Friday uh, this this last Friday to protest against new laws they fear will lead them to being persecuted and prosecuted. Okay. So basically what they want to do is they want to change the laws in Britain where the, the fortune tellers have to prove that they're actually doing something good. So, so it's a consumer protection idea. And uh, so, so these people are, are, are up and upset because they, they have to sort of either say that they're, they're entertainment only, which they don't say, which basically is saying they don't believe in themselves or, or these sorts of things. So they're, they're all upset about this. And so the, the main guy complaining said, and I love this quote, by repealing the act, the onus will go around the other way and we'll have to prove that we're, ge re we're genuine. No other religion has to do that. Well, in fairness, that he's right. Head? <laughs> and not only do I hope this passes, but I hope that after these guys have to prove that they're genuine, religions have to do the same thing yeah, as well. So I would very much like to see that. We got like less than a minute left. Mary, if you can be real quick. Okay, Don, it's your friend Mary. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure. My I computer. <laughs> oh, hey, Mary. Okay, I got okay, you. Okay, real quick. Who... Um, uh, your comments on Mother Teresa. I don't know if you guys knew about that several months ago. Yep. Letters unearthed about her questioning her faith. And I got 20 seconds, so I got to stop you. I'm sorry. Okay. We'll, we'll have to get back to it. We've commented on it before. Actually, yeah, Mother Teresa had a crisis of faith, et cetera. Well, I think a lot of a lot of theists have crises of faith at some point. So That's I don't all think we special. have time for this week. If you want to join us at El Arroyo on Fifth Street here in a few minutes, please feel free to do so. Or you can also email tv at atheist and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.